Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's on this gloriously sunny day. I'm glad that you are all are able to make it. Just a few announcements this morning before we begin. The altar flowers are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Mother Mildred Johnson from Ruth McMaster and Helen Wilson. The Bible study will be again this Tuesday evening held both here in the worship area at six o'clock and on Zoom. Uh, for those who need the link to see, pretty much anyone can get it to you, myself, Brian, Ryan, ask around, the link's available. Uh, also on Tuesday at 7 a.m., uh, some folks gather uh, for morning prayer in the Henderson Lounge, and all are certainly uh, welcome to come and join in prayer at, at 7. You'll find that we, we've been uh, printing the prayer list on the back of the bulletin, so everyone has it. Uh, it's important, of course, that we continue to pray for each other. Uh, that's pretty much it for announcements. As I said, only a few today. If I'm grossly missing anything, I welcome them now. Excellent. Uh, well, then, if you would please turn with me to our call to worship. It is the entirety of Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Please pray with me. Our Father God, we praise you for you are worthy of all praise. We ask that you would tune our hearts and our minds, our souls and our bodies to uh, your word today, we pray for Pastor Brian as he brings it to us, that you would uh, use him to uh, speak truly your words to us. We pray that every aspect of our worship, song, prayer, preaching, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, that in everything uh, we would uh, praise you uh, and that you would uh, guide us along the way. Amen. Good morning. Our opening hymn this morning is found on page 415 of your hymnals at Calvary. That's page 415, and you're welcome to rise if you're willing and able. Grace was free, pardon 
heavens multiplied to me, and my burden so my liberty that fell on me. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back with you this morning. Um, thankful for Ryan filling in last week. So thank you again for that. And uh, the, uh, boy, the music to start us off was quite uh, celebratory. We are celebrating the Lord's Supper. It is a celebration. And that's the way we should see it. We'll talk more about that. Um, also, I just wanted to uh, note that this morning at 6.30, I had some pastors from the area and some uh, other congregants come and pray with me at the, in the Henderson Lounge at 6.30 to pray for the congregation, our needs, our concerns, all of that. So that was, uh, that was something that they do once a month. Uh, they go around to the different congregations. I thought that was really good and enjoyed that this morning. So I want you to know about that. That's all. And so, all right, as we um, look to the scriptures now, our, we have two readings. And so I'm going to read one from the Old Testament, Exodus 24, and then one from the New in uh, Luke chapter, what chapter are we in? I should know this, right? 22. And we're reading uh, verses 14 to 20. So we're going to read all of Exodus 24. And since we're celebrating the supper today, we're not going to be in Isaiah. Uh, we have been working our way through Isaiah. We're not going to be there. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to look at the passage in which Paul gives the words of institution for the supper. So we're going to have a message on that. And then we'll celebrate uh, the supper. So here, uh, the word of God, as it comes to us now from Exodus 24. And then we will turn to Luke 22. So Exodus 24. This is Moses. The people come out and God is giving them instruction. And this is primarily instruction about covenant. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel. And they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets which... Uh, with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with Joshua, his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. But to the elders, he said, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and 
her are with you. Whoever has a legal matter, let him approach them. Then Moses went up to the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain and the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And now we turn to Luke chapter 22. And we read from 14 uh, to 20. And this is Jesus now, the night that he is to be betrayed, the night before he is uh, to die on the cross, <clears throat> meeting with his disciples in the upper room. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Here ends the reading of God's word. Well, we come now to our time of prayer. And as is our practice, I'll, I'll give you a, a moment to pray silently. I'll then lead us in prayer. And we often close with the Lord's Prayer, but today we'll save it for after the supper. Um, and so this is a prayer of confession of sin, the seeking of assurance of pardon. And it's also intercessory. We think of those who are in our hearts and minds today. So we want to pray that way. I'll give you a few moments here to pray silently, and then I'll lead us. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we come before you now as your people, rejoicing, praising, giving thanks to you as you are the God of creation, the God who sustains and cares for us, the God who has made all things and is governing all things to his glory. Help us, Father, to understand that in greater ways. Help us to see that. Give us the eyes of faith. That when we look on this world, we see your hand at work. We understand that you are sovereign, that you are merciful, that you are kind, that you are just and loving and holy like no other. Father, help us to understand that, to live life according to that. To know that we are sinners in need of your mercy, your forgiveness, your grace. Help us to realize that what is true of us and is true of all is that we cannot do these things ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. It is only you who can bring life from death. Father, as we come this morning, we rejoice to know that that life comes through Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished. 
his life, his death, his resurrection. That through him, identifying with him, confessing him as Lord and Savior, we may, through your mercy and grace displayed, enter into your presence and find the healing, the comfort, the peace, the understanding that we need. So we do that. We confess our sins this morning. We confess the ways that we have forsaken you throughout the week. In those moments when we are tempted and fall, we do it in a way that abandons you, that says, I don't want you. Help us to realize that. That should pain us. Help us to understand that in the temptation, give us then the strength to call upon your name. To say that I am yours, save me. Father, help us to realize that in greater ways. Prepare our hearts and our minds for those moments. Let us live life taking every thought captive to you. Father, we pray not only for the forgiveness of our sin this morning, but we pray also that we would, in understanding that forgiveness, know that you are ours and we are yours to have that affirmation that you will never leave nor forsake us, that you hold us, just as Jesus prayed to you regarding his disciples, regarding those who would come through his disciples, that all that you have given him, he has lost none. Help us to understand that, what that means, that he has gone to prepare a place for us, and he will come to take us to be with him. Father, we pray also for those who struggle today, those who have concerns, who have raised them to us. We have placed them on our prayer list and they are in our thoughts and our prayers. And we commit them to you this morning. We do think of a few here specifically. Uh, we do pray for Tim Solomon who is struggling uh, with COVID and Father, we commit him to you as he takes your name for his own. We ask that you show him mercy, bring him healing. We also pray for Chris, a friend who struggles as well with this same affliction and we ask, uh, Lord, that you minister to his body. That you be at work also in his heart and mind to know you. We pray for our friend Colin, who has hurt his arm. And Lord, we pray for healing for him. He is strong. But we ask that you bring him comfort from the pain. Give him mobility of his arm again. We pray for Scott. We pray for Dan and Linda. We pray for June. We pray for Leroy. We pray for Jeff Carpenter. We pray for Lee, we pray for Jack. We pray for Carolee and the Cruz family. We continue to lift them up to you. We pray for those who are still feeling the sense of isolation and fear from this pandemic that you would bring comfort to them. We pray for Susie, 
We pray for Mary and Dan, pray for Elaine and Barb, Roy and Janice. We also pray, Lord, for all of our unbelieving family and friends. They weigh upon our hearts and minds today. We pray for the congregations in this area who call upon your name. We, we are thankful for those who came out this morning to pray on our behalf. And so, Lord, we pray equally for them that as they proclaim your word today, you would open hearts and minds, that you would use them as instruments of your grace and truth in the lives of this community. Father, we commit these things to you now. And we commit to you the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Have is found on page 107. It's a very familiar one, Amazing Grace. If you'd like to remain standing and turn there. time for the young people's message. 
And uh, I heard that uh, Ryan did a very dangerous thing. <laughs> he forgot the treat. Somebody put something. <laughs> oh, did yeah, we, we always have extra, I think, back there. So uh, yeah, you have to be careful the traditions you begin, right? So I'm sorry about that, Ryan. That's on me. Uh, okay, so young people. Young people. Um, I've done this one before, but it's been a little while. So uh, we're coming together this morning to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it is a celebration. As we've said, it's a celebration that combines actions with words that explain those actions. And so, you know, that's often what celebrations are about. This is not something unfamiliar to us. We do this a lot. Can you think of some different celebrations that we have where we have words that go with actions? Can you think of anything like that? I'll just point out. <laughs> uh, what about a birthday, right? A birthday. What do we do? Well, we say happy birthday. We maybe even sing happy birthday, although I always find it somewhat reluctant. To, not because it's the happy birthday, but because, you know, just, you know, it's a, a cappella usually and everybody's a little bit nervous about that. But we sing those words. We say happy birthday. And what are the actions? What are the actions that usually take place at a birthday? We give gifts, right? You get packages. And then you do something with candles. You light candles, you blow out candles. These are all actions, but we have words and we have actions. There's other things too. What about a wedding? A wedding where you have two people coming together and what do they say at a wedding? I do, <laughs> I do, right? And so you have those words, but then what's the action that goes with that I do? What do they exchange? Rings. They put rings on fingers, don't they? So there's words and there's actions. And you can think of any number of celebrations, whether it's graduations, homecomings, whatever. You have words that go with those things, and then you have actions. Maybe it's a meal, you know, whatever it is. We bring those things together, and that's what the Lord's Supper does as well. In fact, there's also a sense in each one of these things of a past, a present, and a future. You know, with the birthday, we're so thankful. Maybe even your parents will recall the day you were born, what a, how all the event went, and then, you know, the, the, the present aspect is, hey, you're celebrating a, another year of life, and then the future is you're looking forward. We do that with weddings too. Two lives in history come together at a point in the present and they look forward to a future that goes together. All of these things, these celebrations have those aspects and that's true of the Lord's Supper as we celebrate today. So um, let me just ask you, why do we do such things? Why do we do such things? It's actually part of who we are. It's the way we've been made. And in some ways it reflects the glory of our creator. These things have always been there and they will always be. We look forward to a day when we will be with him. And guess what we will do? We will have a meal. We will have a great celebration. And so, there are words, there are actions. Here's my question for you. What are the words and the actions? What is said and what do we do today? So listen to the message. We're going to talk about it. But then also watch what goes on with the supper. And we'll talk about that afterwards. What's the treat? Well, this is an easy one. We're coming together. And so we have, you know, togetherness. And I always think in terms of two in terms of togetherness. So it is, as you probably guessed, Twix. No? <laughs> Did you guess Twix? Well, that's what it is. So, uh, okay. Um, 
And yes, thankfully my wife picked up some Twix and we have those in. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's pray, okay? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you again for these young hearts and minds. We thank you for the privilege it is to be able to speak to them about these things, to teach them. And by your grace and the work of your spirit, we pray that their hearts would grow in love for you and your word and your people. We pray that you encourage them to understand these things, to go deeper as they hear the words and they see the actions of this great celebration, that they would grow in that, in their understanding of it. We pray this not only for them, but for all of us. And we ask it to the glory of Christ. Amen. Okay, so our passage this morning is 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. And I'm going to read verses 17 to 34. We're going to go 17 to the end of the chapter. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And this is, uh, even though we call it 1 Corinthians, it's the first Corinthians that we have. There were a number of letters. And so we've called this one uh, 1 Corinthians, but there's probably most likely one before it that we don't have. So, and the other thing is, I want you to remember, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to read this, but I just want you to remember uh, that, you know, as we read these letters of Paul, they are only one side of the conversation. And so we're reading correspondence, but only one side of it. And sometimes that makes it a challenge to understand. So here, uh, the words Paul writes here now to the church at Corinth, starting in verse 17 of chapter 11. But in giving this instruction, and he's giving instruction on orderliness, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthily manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. 
Here ends the reading of God's word. Ever put your life in another man's hands and ask him to put his life in yours? We follow orders, son. We follow orders or people die. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. That's a quote from a movie. I don't know if you recognize that. A Few Good Men. It was Colonel Jessup from A Few Good Men. Although the character's actions in the movie contradict his own words, the whole scene works because it rests upon the importance of a unified commitment to a cause, in this case, defending a nation. This was about uh, Marines, if you saw the movie uh, or didn't see the movie. It was about Marines and the importance of being committed to one another and defending the nation. The military is just one example of people coming together for a common cause. Sometimes we intentionally enter into common cause and other times we are brought into it through a joyous event or a tragic event. We find ourselves united. If you think about it, you know, some of us can remember where we were when Kennedy was shot and who we were with. Some of us can remember exactly where we were when the Twin Towers were struck and who we were with. I remember I had to travel from Austin, Texas, Austin, Texas to Pittsburgh. And I traveled with one man, a teammate, a coworker. And ever since then, we always have this bond. We always remember on 9-11 what we were doing that day. But see, sometimes we come together through a joyous event or a tragic event. Corporations spend top dollar on team building activities, exercises to bond one another together in attempts to manufacture unity. One of the main themes of Paul's letter to the church here at Corinth is unity. A unity that arises from a change in a person's nature. A change that opens the eyes to a whole new way of viewing the world, beginning to see it as it was intended. When a person experiences this kind of change, they are brought into a unity that transcends country and culture, time and social class, age, race, gender, family, friend, or foe. When two people on opposite sides of the world experience this kind of change of nature, and they meet for the first time, they discover a connection that nothing of this world is capable of manufacturing. Only Christ is capable of this kind of unity. A body, if you will. So as we look at our text, I want you to think about this. Commemorating Christ, the supper is to reflect and strengthen our unity in him. Commemorating Christ, the supper is to reflect and strengthen our unity in him. The provincial capital of Greece, Corinth, had a mixed population of Roman, Greek, and Jew. It was a place of much imperial cult activity. That is the worship of Caesar. As a major trade center, the city came to be known for its uncultured wealth and superficial nature, even being referred to at times as sin city. 
there was a significant gap between the wealthy and the very poor. On Paul's missionary journey, which we see in Acts 18, he reasoned in a synagogue there, meeting Aquila and Priscilla, the tent makers. He spent 18 months there. Gallio's proconsulship gives us a reference point for dating Paul's trip somewhere between AD 49 and 50. Often reflecting the divisions of its habitat, the Corinth church caused Paul great distress. In the same letter that provides the greatest definition of love and the most sustained discussion on resurrection, we also find this helpful reference to the Lord's Supper. So we look at our text. We're going to take it in a number of sections, verses 17 to 19. They're coming together with divisions. He says, I do not praise you. How do you like that from the apostle? I do not praise you. You come together not for better, but for worse. Those are strong words. The divisions of the congregation were being reflected in its communion. Its divisions were reflected in its coming together. Verse 19 is, is a difficult verse, but it seems to be saying that in God's plan, there are divisions, and such divisions are for the purpose of exposing true character. Verses 20 to 22, this is where we see the abuse of the Lord's Supper. One of the well-attested characteristics of the New Testament church is its fellowship, coming together for a meal. Often this included celebrating the Lord's Supper, and Corinth was no exception. But Paul's direct language reveals behavior that makes the supper unrecognizable. When you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. I mean, he's saying that they, they are thinking they're coming together to meet, to, to have the Lord's Supper, to celebrate it. But he's saying when you meet together, that's not what's happening. You're not celebrating the supper. The divisions among the congregation were between the rich and the poor. Those of means were arriving early and eating and drinking before the working class. And the worst part of it, the worst part of it was that there was no consideration given to resolving these divisions. The working class poor had opportunity to partake only after they had finished the work day. The rich were coming, those who had means, they didn't need to work, so they were coming and eating and drinking. And what they did by that was shaming those who have nothing. This is Corinth, and we have to keep it in that context. Instead of being a special meal that reflected unity in Christ, it had become self-serving, ordinary and divisive. In verses 23 to 26, Paul received the instruction from Christ. He tells us that he received the instruction for, from Christ, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Now that may be that he received it directly. As we know, he met the Lord on the road to Damascus possibly at other times as well. Or it may be that he received it through the other apostles, those who were with Jesus on that night. But he received the instruction from Christ. Paul sets a context. He says, on the night he, that is Christ, was betrayed, he took bread. Given thanks in the Greek is Eucharistio, 
which we get our word Eucharist, to celebrate the Eucharist. It is important to remember that Jesus is celebrating on that night a Passover meal, a Passover meal with his disciples. He takes the Passover celebration, God's rescuing power in delivering his people from the bondage of Egypt, and he fills it with new meaning. New meaning of an even greater rescue. So again, think about this. This Passover meal is something that Israel would celebrate yearly. And what would they do? Well, they would come together and they would tell the story. They would go through the story of what God did for them, how they as a people went down into Egypt and how they became enslaved and then how God rescued them when he had heard their cries. And all of this goes along with the actions of a meal. And Jesus is doing the same thing now, instituting a new meal, giving it new meaning. Words and actions. The greater rescue and the new, new meal center on his life, death, and resurrection. For in him is the forgiveness of sin and rescue of Israel and all creation. His disciples now are to think as they listen to these things. They are to think on the words and actions of eating and drinking bread and cup. Putting the words together with the actions. I know I'm stressing this. I know it seems simple. But when we think of these things, we want to understand the fullness of it. There is so much more there. And so the words help us to understand the emphasis is on partaking of his body, his sacrificial death. The emphasis is on the cup, his blood of the new covenant. And this is symbolic. In other words, it is done in remembrance of him, in remembrance of him. Exodus 24, as we heard it read, tells us about how covenants were made with the blood of sacrificed animals and that blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, on the altar. The actions that go with that, those words, God establishes peace with his people through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. The meal the disciples celebrated with Jesus, the meal that Paul is describing here to those in Corinth, and the meal we celebrate today anticipates in the present, right now, the kingdom meal that we'll, we will partake of when Jesus returns at the end of the age. There is nothing here that tells us that the bread and wine somehow become the actual, literal body and blood of Christ. It didn't become his body and blood then. It doesn't now. There is no warrant for saying that another sacrifice takes place on the altar. It is rather a commemoration of what Jesus accomplished to relate us in peace to God. And then we come to verses 27 to 34. And these are sometimes controversial. The consequences of those in Corinth, their selfish behavior. In verse 27, we see the words, in an unworthy manner which is translated unworthily in some versions. In an unworthy manner, describe the attitude. These words describe the attitude to the communion by some in Corinth. Unworthily is an adverb describing the manner of the eating, the manner in which they were coming together. It is not an adjective describing the individual's 
character. I want to say that again. This word unworthily is an adverb that describes the manner in which they were coming together. Not an adjective describing the individual's character. Paul was saying that there was a problem with what was happening at the actual communion service in Corinth. And in this respect, it made them guilty. Listen to the words of Charles Hodge, Presbyterian theologian principal of Princeton Theological Seminary between 1851 and 1878. These are older words. But what is it to eat and drink unworthily? It is not to eat and drink with a consciousness of unworthiness. For such a sense of ill desert is one of the conditions of acceptable communion. What does he mean by that? He's saying that it's not to eat and drink feeling unworthy because that's the very thing that you already do feel unworthy. That's already a given. That's a sense of ill desert is one of those conditions of acceptable communion to recognize that you are unworthy of this is the sense of yeah you should be partaking of this he goes on to say and this is important to eat or drink unworthily is in general to come to the lord's table in a careless irreverent spirit without the intention or desire to commemorate the death of christ as the sacrifice for our sins, and without the purpose of complying with the engagements which we thereby assume. That's a lot. That's, you know, principal uh, <laughs> at Princeton Theological. What he's saying here is that the people were coming and not giving any regard to anyone else. They were not thinking. They were not putting the words of Christ with the actions of eating. They were thinking of just eating and drinking. The way in which the Corinthians ate unworthily was that they treated the Lord's table as though it were their own, making no distinction between the Lord's supper and an ordinary meal, coming together to satisfy their hunger and not to feed on the body and blood of Christ and refusing to commune and drink. I'm sorry, refusing to commune with their poor brethren. This, though one, is not the only way in which men may eat and drink unworthily. All that is necessary to observe is that the warning is directly against the careless and profane and not against the timid and doubting. So the point is, they were not giving any consideration to those around them. This is what the meal is all about. That's why Paul said, I don't even recognize it, what you're doing. Robertson's word pictures on this word unworthy or to, to celebrate in a worthy manner or an unworthily manner Robertson words, word picture says, it's an old adverb. Only here in the New Testament, Paul defines his meaning in verse 29. He does not say or imply that we ourselves must be worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. To eat and to drink in such a way as to be guilty of a crime against the body and blood of Christ. In a sense, it is to make the Lord's Supper just another meal. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, but a man must examine himself may be rendered, but let a person examine his or her own genuineness. Gordon Fee notes that this is not about a deep introspection of personal character to determine if one is worthy, but about the attitude toward the table and others at the table. We must understand, and this is me saying, we must understand that the Lord's Supper, unlike any other meal, is a source of spiritual blessing. It directs us to God's greatest saving act in history, the person of Jesus. There's no place for division. The unity that Christ provides transcends any 
and every category. In verse 29, Paul reiterates their problem and where they go wrong. Look at verse 29. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. What does he mean there, does not judge the body rightly? How is he using that word body? Could it be a dual meaning here? We know that the bread, you know, he has said the bread is his body given for you, right? But how is Paul using that word here, body? Once again, Paul uses the word body, but this time without the word blood. It may be the case that Paul is using the word body to mean the fact that they are not recognizing believers. They're not recognizing the body of believers. In verse 27, he speaks of Christ's person, but here he may be including believers as one with Christ. Certainly, Paul would understand this from his own experience on the road to Damascus, right? You think about that. When he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The Lord says that to him. Why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? Well, here Paul. Saul of Tarsus had been persecuting the church, the body of Christ. So Paul understands these things. And he possibly is saying here that when they are coming together, they're not recognizing the body. They had brought their social divisions into the church, into the Lord's Supper. And as a result, verse 29 tells us, they left themselves open to judgment. That's what this does. There are consequences for treating it like just another meal. Some were even experiencing such judgment, not as a matter of eternal judgment, but discipline in love. The conclusion is that they are to wait for one another to view the Lord's Supper rightly. Let me make a few points of application, and then we're going to celebrate the Supper. Again, it's interesting to note that we would not have these words of institution had it not been for the problems at Corinth. Interesting, huh? We may not struggle with the obvious dis divisions that they did, but it doesn't mean that we do not struggle at all. Just because we're, the, we're in the same room at the same time doesn't mean that we have no cause for concern. This is part of what it means to examine ourselves. How do we view one another? How do we view this meal together? The problems at Corinth are written for our encouragement. To warn, yes, and to encourage us to examine the way we view the body, the body of Christ, that is, his person and his people. Union with Christ means union with his people, not a manufactured unity, but a natural one, a unity that transcends culture, time, social class, age, race, gender, all of these things. A unity strengthened in and through the celebration of the meal that Jesus gave us. These are words to live by. This is my body. This is my blood. Commemorating Christ's suppers to reflect and strengthen our unity in him. So let's do that. Let's celebrate the Lord's Supper. And again, what I'll do is read from... Chapter 11 here, the words of institution, and I've got to turn on my mic, I forgot. So, we'll see if this works. Test, test. Can you hear me? Is that okay? All right. So, we'll celebrate the supper here.
I'm just going to read these. The Apostle Paul writes again, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the words. We'll now do the actions. His body given for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
cup of the new covenant in his blood, take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim in the present, I'm putting that in there, in the present, the Lord's death in the past until he comes in the future. Okay? That's what this meal is about. The words, the actions, they go together. Let's close uh, with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll tell you what, let's do verses one and four. One and four. So page 443 is our closing hymn. That's 443. You're welcome to rise and sing together. And we're doing verses one and verse four. First and last. of God receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>